was the curator of uh, Christine's show. Let me introduce um, today we have uh, Christine's talk. Uh, she will share um, her experience of architect and among the others. And also today we are pleased to uh, have Dima Samarano um, to be our guest moderator to yeah, question to Christine. Uh, first, um, Jose Mar Samarano is a um, Mexican Canadian visual artist and interdisciplinary educator. He has a PhD at UBC in 2012. He previously worked as a telecommunication engineer, either in academia or art making. He is interested in the various ways we come to understand the world through science and technology, poetry, philosophy, and visual arts. And Christine, please come here. <laughs> <laughs> Christine Man. Uh, she's born in Hong Kong, currently live in Vancouver. So, how long? Oh, wait, how long? Uh, Two and a half years. Yeah, since right now, uh, she trapped here and then luckily have the shows here. <laughs> Drifted and, here. Uh, and she holds a BA from Brown University, Rock Island, and an MBA from Columbia University, New York. She's an interdisciplinary artist as well, and she is a photographer and also a writer many of poetry. She is an author of two photo poetry books, uh, which are over there. Um, yeah, after uh, you can take a look at some of the books. And she draws papers from the human traditions, her multidisciplinary education, her yoga practice, and her personal context. Christine focuses on the theme of connection and relation with uh, relational identity and encourage our viewer to ask questions on what being human might mean. On the thesis as well, on the um, grading of histories, the spaces, um, in, in very poetical ways, very um, subtle and, and sometimes uh, powerful ways. Um, some, of, some of the pieces here, uh, they even uh, take on, on, on long, uh, very old histories of, of also colonization, an exploitation you know, as, a, as a sort of woman piece, as you can see, right? Uh, and um, given that poetry is sort of a, a backbone you know, of, of, of the show, uh, actually, uh, there is a poem that sort of like uh, goes around the pieces and goes up the stairs, and you can find pieces of the poem here and there, even, even on the floor, in some places here. Um, when I was here for the, for the first uh, round of, of my own tour uh, in the show, uh, I, was, I was sort of reminded of, of a poem by a Mexican uh, poet, Octavio Paz, Nobel Prize 1990, um, that I had a chance to do some studies on, on, on this poet before. Um, and, um, and I was reminded of a poem that, that, that right away sort of like came to my mind. I thought of reading a couple of stances from, from, from one of his poems and then make a sort of like fun exercise of doing a collective reading of Christine's poem that is all the way around the exhibit. And then we open the conversation to, to, to see what you guys... Uh, this, this one from Octavio Paz is between what I see and what I say, uh, from 1976, from Octavio Paz. And I'm just reading a couple of pieces here uh, from, from the poem. It starts uh, between, between what I see and what I say, between what I say and what I keep silent, between what I keep silent and what I dream, between what I dream and what I forget, Poetry. Tangible idea, intangible word. Poetry comes and goes between what is and what is not. It waves and unwaves reflections. Between my favorite sonata and another crescendo in the syndrome, the rest and staccato, it plays like this. Between a flow and a backflow, a flow and yet another, the pause and the end. It undulates like this. Between the lightning and the thunder, a cloud envelops like the peace that interrupts the conflicts of the heart. Between the drops of rain, consonants and bubble, today and tomorrow, like the crevices alongside my finger. After very little, a bit too much, when these simply are. Between a cut and a leaf, a leaf and another. Memories and testimonies, meditative envy. 
Between the yellow and the violet, the fabric of our humanity, light of dawn and dusk, blood has laced the blue. Certain questions remain, not only time and space, my world breathing its meaning in the meantime. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. How would you talk about this relationship that you have with uh, poetry in many ways, no? Because, I mean, uh, Stephen was already talking about a couple of books that uh, that you have written before. Uh, this is called <laughs> From Some Great Matter, which is a poetry photography book, is both things, uh, either playing with text or visual poetry. And then there is other one here, this 9-9 nine, nine, uh, book, that is mostly an Italy experience of uh, waving many stories of many people. I don't know how many people came into this project. Over 127. <laughs> I visited 150 students. And in, in a way, as well as sort of waving of identity, I guess, for, for Christians. And, um, and it's also very poetic in, in, in several ways. You know, either text uh, that she was collecting from several artists, or in the way that the book is made as well, and, and the photos the themselves as well. So. Uh, you've been writing poetry, you've been, you've been doing this kind of work that is very different from this work, by the way, you know, what you find in books that are still very connected. Afterwards, but, uh, you can have a chance to, <laughs> to see if you think they are the same or different. <laughs> yeah. um, I have been writing poetry alongside um, my photographic practice since a teenager. And I would write and read at that time mainly in. Chinese and English, so I went to bilingual schools. But mm -hmm. after my last, let's just say, before Vancouver, I was in Italy for four years. And one of the reasons why I wanted to do this project was actually I wanted to speak Italian. Mm -hmm. and, and it became part of my cognitive process. And so I started writing also in Italian and in poetry and prose. And I think it's very important for me to formulate and refine and explore my being through poetry, not just my ideas. It, in this case of Fragments of Grey Matter, it sets the tone of the whole atmosphere of the official steps that I took, which became the book and as a whole official poetry. In the case of uh, Nine Nine in Italy, it was inspired um, by an artist that I was talking to in several sittings in Florence, a painter who mostly engaged with me in philosophy. So we were talking a lot over coffee, philosophies, and the literature that he would study. And when I would leave Florence and go to other places to, to take photos, and like many of the friends that I've made during the process, they were always wanting to see like, where I have gone. And he asked me a question over three emails, the same question. And so I was like, this sounds like a poem. I'm going to turn it into a complete poem and put it into the book. And the question was like, where has the black butterfly flown in Italian? It doesn't sound quite right in, in English, but it repeatedly, like, it iterate in such a way that I wrote it into this case. I was developing the project. Well, it's been, this is my fourth year. After like half a year of doing uh, a few pieces, and we all attempted a portrait as I think music and lyrics are the same kind of, has the same kind of DNA to me as poetry. And I started making a piece called Moonlight Sonata now because I was just listening to Moonlight Sonata on the loop for I don't know how many hundreds of times. That's why Kevin just now read the first stanza out with the word sonata and crescendo, the crescendo. These are like musical terms. And I started carrying on with the series. Some of these pieces have a stanza referring to it, like the second last side in the fabric of humanity, blood has laced the blue. Uh, it's very much this piece called Tribute to Song the Slave Ship, and you can have a look when we will probably talk a little bit, maybe if you have questions. And then upstairs there's a piece called Light of Dawn of Dusk. Like, that's a line coming from a conversation with an Italian painter who was working on a series, a biblical series, and I saw the light, and we were talking about hope. And I, I asked him, more than he asked him, I said, Did you, when you have this line, light in, in the paintings, did you have in mind it was 
dawn or dusk? And that it was the loaded question, do you think that we are in doomsday or we can continue to hope? <laughs> so, like, it just came to me, like, not really making a lot of effort. In, in, in uh, most cases, when I write poetry, it comes within 10, 15 minutes, and the rest is just refining over time, but the crux is there. But uh, even, even in the title alone, the official Amare, uh, that uh, makes sense in several languages in many ways, no? Uh, but there is there already a sort of piece of poetry going on and, and a symbol that comes with it. Uh, I, I was trying to find the symbol in the, in the title. I, I don't think I saw it, but I think it's in the back of the 9-9 of the book. But it's a, it's a piece that is at the no, beginning. No, uh, it's not there because at that time I had made it. I'm wearing it today. Oh, there you go. So <laughs> as you enter the, yeah. the show, I don't think you could have missed the orange lit LED it's sign. Neon the lit. first version of Ever Made was actually um, a turquoise blue. It is a real meal. And in light of how I've been feeling a lot with the indigenous stories that has been unraveling throughout the year, I, I had instinctively said to myself, look, I have to have it in orange. Like, it's like no brain or something. Hamada is actually coming from my Italian. And throughout the times when I was in Italy, I was shooting double cell portraits. Alongside, and which were to become this book. Alongside, as Italy has the longest coastline in the Mediterranean, and I, of course, I swim in the sea, I do a lot of things that I see, I live and breathe the sea. So I had a whole stack of sea related photos. And, and then I also naturally meet a lot of people who have a fondness for the sea. And they might paint or do other things related to the sea. So I'm like, I'm not that interested in straightforward photography for the seascapes as I know better photographers who have done very beautiful things and I'm always interested in uh, doing something different with my own meaning. Like you can refer to Tsukimoto's like, uh, seascapes and how he would show seascapes continuously around the world and you know show you his view of the world. I wanted to talk about connections and even if aesthetically this has not a single figurine or figure in the works, unlike in my last book, in, you know, done in Italy, they have double self portraits. I'm still talking about connections. The act of me entering into frame together with another artist in the frame, in a, in a double self portrait for me, is talking about human connection. How, you know, you don't ever take a picture with someone else if you don't have any interest in this person in one way or another. Similarly, we are actually uh, connected in many ways, and I wanted you to use the sea as a metaphor of our connectedness because of the mutability and also in effect. Like, most of you used to work as a telecommunications engineer, and I think you know, no, you know, you, you know better than anybody. Like, I knew from research that our submarine cables have been embedded in our ocean deep down since the 1800s. It's a physical uh, reality. We have radiation passing through waters from Japan to Sichuan in our coastline. And we have great Pacific garbage patch. So we can talk about a lot of things that give us the connection. Those are the bad and ugly, but then the good could be, how about us? You know, we uh, today, for example, having a talk, sharing ideas, later on we will be asking you questions, giving you feedback. This is a kind of exchange. And I am kind of like this part of diaspora floating <laughs> from sea to sea, and I've landed here. And that's why I'm installed with this piece as opposed to, you know, I'm wearing uh, a dress. This is actually an installation that you would normally find if I'm not there on the wall, but um, at the back, you know, on the surface. So it's talking about kind of flow, and I think in the advent of a lot of xenophobia and I guess globalization is a definite thing that will happen whether you like it or not. Um, an exchange of goods has always happened in, in, for economic reasons. Exchange of ideas or artists doing artist residencies these are just all climate change that is going to displace millions of people who can no longer live where they would rather stay. 
we are having to deal with a lot of this kind of uh, integration issues. And it is not a given that people find it easy to come to terms with or reconcile with suddenly having to deal with things that come throw at them outside their comfort zone. I um, have had the privilege to have been educated or like to have traveled uh, in many places and in some ways after I've gone to Atlantic College um, in Wales, which is a very diverse international school, like 70 countries are presented in the student body of 350 people. Uh, in this network of schools called United World Colleges, there is such a school called Pearson College in Victoria. And now I think there is easily like 19 of such schools dotted all over the world. With the goal after the Second World War, uh, founded by Sir Kurt Hahn, to improve international understanding and world peace, and so hopefully we can afford uh, a World War III. And I have kind of made a mission to myself, and I was looking at people who are a lot, lot more interesting, a lot more mixed, like, oh, why wasn't I born like, I don't know, with a quarter of being Chinese, a quarter of uh, Italian, I don't know, like a quarter German and a quarter from Latin America. Like, so I can't change my construction as in my, my, my genes. But I kind of feel like I've given myself a different upbringing uh, away from the family. Like I wanted to actually form myself in, in, in a very different way so that I can become more varied and in such ways I can make myself more interested. I wanted to have um, an intending uh, for the entire world. So that became something given to me, but I can appreciate that a lot of people sitting in one place all his or her life probably wouldn't feel the same thing. And you have to remember that this project started when I finished the Italian project in 2017. At the end of that, you might remember what's going on in the world of geopolitics. All these things got me to really think about why such uh, events, why, why such results, and I don't think they came about for no reason, but whether they are good reasons or can we circumvent these things is another, is another question. So that's like the context in which I started developing this project, and then throughout the course of the last four years, obviously, a lot of things came into mind, like you can probably see some pieces have a ecological and go to it, you can see some like plastic here and there, and the bottom one is called Sea on Fire. I actually made that piece one month prior, not after. I don't know whether you saw the news on what happened in the Gulf of Mexico. Mm -hmm. The sea got burned, and I was like, you know, when I made that, I had no idea that was going to happen, right? Mm -hmm. So what what happened to me? I don't know, like, maybe it's the meditation, maybe it's the awareness that actually, I mean, oil can definitely burn. Mm -hmm. but. I don't think any, anybody would expect the sea being on fire, catching fire every day, right? So uh, things like that. So a lot of preoccupations, concerns, there all over the staircase is a piece called Old Range Canada. So Old Canada, because range is put in parentheses. So I'm playing with... There's the one on top in the second In the frame. Right? The only piece that is framed. Uh -huh. That is in the second. Was made during the summer. I feel like a lot of people are attracted to living in Canada for stability and, and reasons like that, and it's a very apparently tranquil place, but deep down we have a lot of layers and sedimentation, you know, figuratively speaking. Yeah, so poetry. Yeah. Well, <laughs> to, yeah. to amare it means to love without the hyphen. Yeah. And in if, Spanish it works as well. If yeah. there is a space in lieu of the hyphen, it means to the sea. So the play on the word is really like to go to the sea is to love or to both. And, and it's interesting that uh, love comes uh, as, a, as, a, as a theme of the, of the show and, and, and this sort of like very important thing for you because you usually talk a lot about this connection with Amare as, as the ocean, but also love as, as, as relationships that you've been, you've been talking a lot about that, no? about, um, like the work in Italy is all about making those connections with people. Um, that seems to be in many of the of the photos themselves. They show a lot of intimacy, you know, with all the people that you're relating to there. Uh, but I wonder, I mean, from that kind of stuff that you have in the in the books, that is, is like uh, photography in two dimensions and very flat, to coming into weaving these histories here 
uh, in this way? How, how you, you make sort of like that transition? How, how this came to be? Um, too many things. <laughs> um, the fact that photography traditionally has been classified in a certain way, you kind of have a view that this is a 2D thing and there, there is, it's almost in a, uh, most museums would put them in a very different department uh, in the art sector. And uh, in light of the fact that I'm clearly trying to uh, put out a discourse on definitions of uh, limitations of labels, I like to challenge borders through a challenge of questioning of mediums. And so basically, to put it in outside of art terms, and all my stuff is like that, if I can say that in life, generally, it totally would apply to me in art, because art is a discipline, a tool for me to explore in life, which is why I'm interested in so many things that could help me open up the Pandora box of life. So then I'm like, okay, a bad example, but I, can, I think that it would be very easy to, for people to relate is, have you ever gone to having Peking duck in a Chinese restaurant? So usually they will offer you, okay, the whole Peking duck, but you can have it in two or three different dishes. The first one is they slice the skin, that's the first serving. Then this, the option would be, do you want it in a duck soup or do you want it like dice up and you know you wrap it with lettuce? Or like in my family, we would have it the whole thing because we can get all the meat out of the duck. <laughs> so what I'm saying is, photography. How many ways can you cut photography and present it and express it? And why do we have to confine ourselves? Like if you like it that way, of course, but I, I wanted to explore it more. And just, just by looking at you, you have taken it from far. <laughs> <laughs> to the marathons, even. So, so that was my starting point. Why does it have to be just too deep? Mm -hmm. And the breaking the barriers mm -hmm. and my yoga studies, because my yoga is not just a physical thing like in the Western. I, I know a lot of people already know that. It is not a physical uh, alone kind of practice. To me, it is enabling me to research a lot about human body, how the body works, mm -hmm. and the fascia and the muscles and the skeleton, and how they interrelate, amazing. How you talk about healthy body, healthy mind. Also, the word Tantra in Sanskrit. Tantra actually means weave. There's no like no other way to put it. It really means weave. Yoga could have many different other words, synonyms to it. It means union. Yeah, you go in the Spanish as well. Right. Yeah. Um, so how do you align what is yourself with your calling, whatever you define it to be? It does have doesn't have to have any religious connotation. But I believe that there is a lot going on in our unconscious. We talk about Carl Jung and this symbol of ocean representing our unconscious. Um, Dean Kleiner, uh, as Liam pointed out, like you read my, uh, the Dion's write up on, posted in Two Coats of Pain, which is a very now New York based blog. How to really see the sea. It's like trying to fathom unconscious. It's like, you know, you, it's a very interesting exercise, but clearly there is no ending. And through the practice of my hand cutting and hand weaving, uh, apart from the mental exercise of relating different images, how one could relate to the other was a total meditative exercise. That is the reason why some people would say, oh, did you put it into a computer and have, have it, you know? <laughs> Doesn't look like you, know, it, you could get, get it like that, but I'm not the person to do that because I'm only interested in how I could engage with the, the process, the tactility, through this hand-mind process. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I find very interesting that uh, it's not just the making and just in itself, uh, an act of making a two-dimensional idea of images into 3D, but that there are lots of histories woven, and, and, and you were already talking about some environmental concerns. Some of the pieces are actually very politically, historically uh, politically loaded, like uh, this one here, um, the, the tribute to song, the slave ship, uh, that takes on, on, on a horrible historical event of, of um, 
So that, 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 that was uh, done during April of last year, you might remember, we just started our lockdown. And coincidentally, or in parallel, in parallel we had Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. I had seen the original Turner painting called The Slave Ship many years ago. Mm -hmm. Had a very strong impression left in my head, like, because Turner's this British painter, extremely well, done, well known, famous, already made at the time when he decided to paint something quite out of ordinary because he, is, he was primarily renowned for his seascapes uh, with a kind of romantic touch, like, you know, just beautiful seascapes. Suddenly, there is this one that was very controversial and some of his clients didn't like it and bear in mind that he's a white guy. He didn't really have to. Care. And responding to the times as well, no? Because he was the time of the discussion of the... Slavery being abolished, slavery, right? yes. And he presented this painting in front of the king at that time hoping that he would be an advocate to also get America abolishing slavery because England already on the surface abolished slavery. But there were a lot of illegal stuff going on, but the US still was just like carrying out the transatlantic you know, slave trade. This isn't even the only incident in our history whereby slaves took, got took, taken overboard and thrown overboard uh, and, and hundreds of people would die. And in this case, 133 was you know, thrown overboard on record because they ran out of supplies or some of them got sick. And so in order to avoid like, them arriving as a dead corpse and not be able to claim insurance money, because remember that they are labels as, as cargo, not as human beings. So uh, 133 got thrown overboard. Most of them, the original painting, they were shackled, ground shackled, thrown into the sea, struggling, showing blood and fish, starting to attack them. So that was the original. If you don't see it, but there's a layer there. And then I have like two seascape uh, pictures, one taken in Hong Kong with this rusty red, like taken at dusk. And then one in Vancouver and then many small uh, bird images. I was thinking because it, it looks like just a bunch of stuff going on, but if you look carefully, there, there are like a small areas. And most of the birds are in press apart from the only one, which is a peacock that I put upright in mm -hmm. the middle. You really have to go in to see. I know it because I made it. And because um, peacock has the symbolic meaning across many cultures for transformation, hope, <laughs> resurrection, things like that, depending on which religion you're referring to. And in, in my head, it's like, okay, you know, it's, it's done like a burial. We were talking about, uh, you know, David Quammen wrote a book called Spill Over about diseases and how human beings um, probably live in too crowded way and we've abused our environment and stuff like that. So that came about with that idea, like, you know, we're massively raising poultry for our own consumption, things like that. So this was done literally like a burial. Mm -hmm. And with the people still <laughs> standing upright, it was like my, my, probably my own need to feel there is still hope if we choose well. And the embedded poetry, like layers, right? William Turner also wrote a small poem mm -hmm. to go along, along with his own painting. When he was exhibited there, right? Then, yeah. then we have a Canadian mind over uh, Phillips who wrote a, a poem called one. Song. Our common friend also knows it very well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and she pointed me to that, actually, as <laughs> I was mm -hmm. talking about the Turner painting. So layers and layers of poetry. How about you folks? I mean, what, is, what, what are your questions? Uh, what are your concerns about the show? Do you like? Yes. How long did it take to make that piece? The yes, song was. Yes. Maybe a, a month or two, but like every day, plenty of hours. Mm -hmm. yeah. Planning was actually a long time. I usually do that. Like I usually map things out. I find that dreaming. <laughs> because, because you say planning, and it, it, it looks like, I mean, it sounds like you would like prefigure what is going on, but at the same time, once you look at the thing, I mean, it cannot be that much of a planning, right? I mean, it's, it's about doing the thing. Oh, and, I, I and plan following how, the process sure, kind sure. of thing. Like, it's a balance of things. But right? you notice that this so called weave, actually, yeah. many of the weaves are very different, but this is particularly complex and dense. Oh. Compared to let's say mm -hmm. the pieces from like behind, nice. the verticals, mm -hmm. right. over there, horizontals, uh, their black hole sun is more like a tangle mm -hmm. inspired by the spiral, and so yeah. are the tori, the hang 
you know, the hangings on, on the ceiling here and there, which I call Taurus and Eclipse. This, I, I think I, I made the decision to do it in a certain way, but once I started, then it wasn't so much planning as, right, right, as right. the tactility, as how can I get it work. Yeah. 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 What are they printed on? Is it paper? Mix. Uh, so or? even just this piece is a mix of paper and uh, ecologically printed polymer and normal photographic papers for the birds. Some of them are more like canvas kind of picture, no? This that paper, one is very canvas. This is very yeah. canvas like. And then of course the foam is just a collected piece from some packaging. More like cloth, uh, the one there in the very back, right? It's more like cloth, uh, no? more like this kind of cloth. Fabric. Yeah, fabric, exactly. Yeah. Uh, you spoke about parallel between writing uh, poetry and visual poetry of the future. And so there's a certain parallel in, in the way you work. And then when you talk about planning, can you say something about like, the complexity of these materials requires a certain amount of planning? Mm -hmm. And so it seems like that seems to militate against how I would imagine poetry being written that is perhaps with or without planning. So I'm wondering if you can speak about maybe convergence or divergence of those processes that maybe 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 poetry does require planning. I don't know. I don't write poetry, so um, you do. Come on, I've seen some of your stuff. <laughs> poetry comes into my head with a sound, mm -hmm. and that sound would guide me to create the other sounds. Here we're talking about images with references to maybe memory, with really specific graphic visual, like, oh, that place, and I'm here, and I'm like, this is the piece we'll go with that. The poetry in some ways is more, uh, I wouldn't say totally linear, but probably in comparison to the official work, a little bit more linear. How, how does a piece of work start and how does it evolve? You, you said poetry comes from a sound sometimes. Can you tell us a little bit about the evolution within you of maybe this piece of work? And I'm thinking that you do a lot of photography as people came in. And is that going to turn into something? Uh, all, of the, like, all of these are my own photographs, right? So. There is a kind of organized chaos going on in my head with respect to the images. Some of them were really obvious to me that I would use them in one way or another in the series, but I might have it printed out and let it sit and percolate until, oh, I found the best match for this kind of thing. Or like the colors in some cases uh, speak to me and I want them to, to work with one another. For example, I wanted to do Black Hole Song, which is actually really inspired the lyrics of that song, taught with, with a reference to too many snakes in the society. It's interesting how the snake is a symbol for very ambiguous things. One could be transformation protection, a guardian. The other, like even a medical symbol. You, you know about the curling, coiling, you know, things, two snakes. It could be a symbol for evil. So I, I'm then playing with ambiguity and also I had in my head, I wanted to do a spiraling thing and I wanted to refer to the song. And so it would be a stack of four different images taken with the same horizon line, but with a hint of the sun. And then I would go out and, and cut and relate them. And, and during that process of relating, it's a little bit more organic. But then I would have chosen those four images to go there, not the other millions. <laughs> so I don't know if that's a systematic process, but like there is some kind of system. Like I go through the whole series similarly. It, it, it seems to me like you have this open, very creative, connecting things but then you also have this discipline taking this stuff because that's and, me. and doing something. That because I, 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 I've been, like, I've been uh, talking to people who write about my work. 
and that comes up quite often because I, I think I have a very structured side and I have a very like flowy side mm -hmm. and you know, we talk about discipline and stuff like and, and I would you know if I wanted to let's say research snake I would read up everything that is out there and that could be referring to snake to not make a mistake like what that snake could mean kind of thing right so the structure is definitely there and when I come to make appointments it, there's a structure. I don't go through making appointments in an artistic way, say I make an appointment at 2 and I show up at 4 and never show up. Then I employ the creative side to where creativity according to me should go. So, because this wouldn't, like, you, you have that there's a conscious decision in choosing what image you're choosing. Like, when it comes to uh, Back to Venus, the piece that we will talk about with Sammy now. This piece here. Mm -hmm. In my mind, there's a certain thing that has to happen, but I couldn't be doing it without knowing how someone could employ software doing blah blah, you know, what comes with the technicality. So there is the dreamy me thinking, I want an interactive piece because I want people to be weaving the images, creating the images using our platform. But exactly how that's going to look after I would have had that help looking at the work and seeing does that work, does that not work, that's kind of like you can call it organic and step by step but then I think the blueprint was always there. So it's like a mix of you know ideas, composition, structure, flow, which I think that's how I go about my life basically. Yeah. And something like this took there was a lot of structure once you got going, right? Yeah. Like so you could stay in structure for a long time so this is fun. Correct. Because this to me would absolutely not work if I suddenly like change the way I read, the whole thing would pop fall apart. It wouldn't even hold. Like have you tried knitting? Maybe you haven't, but <laughs> I'm not really a knitter, but I've seen, you know, my mother or like women knitting. Like if you miss a stitch, the whole thing looks like what's going on, you know? You can tell when it's really wrong. Let's, let's try. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, by the time I started and decided on the cutting, not even the weaving. I had in mind that this is this has to happen and I'm gonna be the person sticking to it throughout, right? So I would be cutting it this fine if I wasn't prepared to do the work. I would just cut them big straps, right? Like that piece, which I call C4 part two, it looks big and it took me a long time to work out. But at least the strap, the, the, the cuts are very organized in a certain way and the way I would weave through the whole thing was a lot more like less entangled, I would say. I mean, it did take me climbing on a big ladder for and being there for a long time and being able to walk, I mean, go up and down and do the stitching, pinning throughout. That's another kind of, you know, structure. So actually, there are different structures going on. Like it's not just even one structure, but every piece has a pre-planned structure. But again, it can't just suddenly go into a spiral. It wouldn't work. Try it, Jerry. Um, I'm really interested in the piece, the video piece that you have here, and I'm just wondering what the relationship Should is between this piece and your other approach. So uh, we're gonna turn it back, the sound back on. But the reason why there is movement, maybe Sammy can join me and help me talk through it. Yeah, please come on. Thank is you. that there's a sensor out there and then there's a computer program that picks up your, your movement. <laughs> Sammy, Sammy is a genius here. No, no, no. Many of these things work. Yeah. Thank right. you for being here, Sammy. Oh, yeah, it's great. Sammy's like, yeah, work. <laughs> seriously like busy with like big clients and corporations and also yeah, the the theater <laughs> art work and like, like multi-talented. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so hi everyone, my name is Sammy Chen. I am the lead artist for this installation called Back to Venus. And uh, I just want to say uh, thank you to BC Arts Council for funding Christian to uh, do this project. Uh, and acknowledge my uh, collective Tumeric Solution Collective for supporting this work uh, in collaboration with uh, Christian on the concept. And also Stephen, who's so humble, uh, he actually did a lot with our uh, conceptualization, also the technical support as well. So thank you, Stephen. And, um, yeah, this piece actually is one of the smoothest process I've had in a long time. Uh, 
he, we really, like I met Christian not too long, just a few months ago, and she happened to come across my older work, uh, I think 2016, I started 2016 called Weaves, with a bracket on my so it's like wave and weaves with the electronic, right? So I think our, it's all meant to be, it's all like the universe already planned it together for us to meet and do this. So when she came to me to say, hey, I really need to, you know, your, your work, because I also do media art and I'm very spiritual and I, I do movement dance as well. I'm like, oh, okay, that's kind of all the things I do. And I, I recently got the poetry too. I don't know if you've seen my recent work that I'm still writing again with all the visual poems. So everything's kind of coming together in a way that really makes sense. And uh, we, so we, we kind of travel an hour and then came down here for another 45 minutes, I think, and we came up with this concept really quickly. Just, you know, when you vibe people really well, you just, there's no bullshit, and just like, boom, 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 and everything starts to happen, and it happens really fast. And that's how it kind of came about. So we just kind of talked about the idea of like, okay, the impact we have on nature, right? And how do we take a more spiritual, interdimensional lens to our manifestation to reality as artists, that the work that we do, you know? So I was interested in, you know, how that sweet spot when we do meditation, how you can't just go around and explore, you gotta find a way to kind of tune in to the right distance. So it's about tuning in. And so in this work, you, uh, when you get the chance to explore, there is a sweet spot, or there is some place that a sweet spot that actually create more impact to the, to the work than other places. So that's for you to explore as well. Um, and this like, we're also thinking about decolonizing dance, right? Because my, I don't have a dance background and also, um, you know, our lens of movement art is quite different from the colonial like training of our dances, right? So uh, not to demonize it, but we all know that oh, a lot of us are kind of shame our body, this body shame that we go through uh, when, when we move through space, thinking that we got moving in a certain way. Um, this work also is to, I mean, part of the technology interactive work is not just be playfulness, you know. It, even though that's part of the big invitation, is that enchantment, the magic, and the playfulness to invite audience to be more accessible to our work. So we're not trying to be super smart, try to criticize it in our work, right? Want to open up the doors for people to play, right? But at the same time, I was thinking around the how to transform information that's invisible. So the things we don't see in in, in real life, right? As a human body, you know, we, we don't see dark matter, we don't see the ether, you know, we don't see even see infrared light, and the camera can see it, right? So. So technology is there to really help us to transform the information that we actually don't see. So how do we turn those, those uh, image information to something uh, visible? So we have, you, yes, that's why I use like this like, kind of infrared sensor at the top there uh, that we see infrared light. And it understands body and space. You understand, it gives you the, the mass of body and where you are in, in place uh, in relation to the sensor itself. So then, in some way, I think of it as we sense, or try to sense the unknown through the vehicle of technology itself, feeding back to our system to help us understand how do we relate to one another. And, um, and this is the only place that we also get to do, like, also, also get to define gravity as well. So this is kind of the thing that Christian was thinking about on the walls, like thinking, hey, water, liquid, flow, energy, and all the things we talk about in Qigong and meditation, like, you know, how do we then also think about, hey, like, how can we define gravity if we're going to Venus, you know? Like, what does water look like, you know? And just have that kind of uh, imagination for us to define gravity together uh, with the body and how you interact with the technology itself. And another thing, like, I didn't know the piece of, the work was called Back to Venus when she told me, it's like, let's name Back to Venus. I was like, yeah, oh I already decided. I didn't even ask. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like in the deepest, I think, at the peak of my like ascension, spiritual ascension, <laughs> and like really thinking about what, uh, how we look at planets. You know, there's astrology, there's all the things you know that are all available, and there are like there are people who I don't know if you all like you know are into like spiritual uh, kind of messengers and. I, I was just researching on the Venusians, like, so people came from Mars that uh, descent on Mars and, think, and talking about how hard it is to be human because we have to do things so backwards, such a very evolved way to uh, interact. You have to move this like 
this pledge to to get things done, where a lot of like interdimensional being, you you actually just move consciousness. That's how you manifest and how you create, how you interact, right? Uh, and people who does telepathy you know it's like basic level of that, right? You you basically can channel through consciousness. So I was thinking like, oh my god, like I, I do think the, all these territories are very interesting, all these like interdimensional knowledge are coming in. And then when she said back to Venus, I was like, yes, let's go let's go back to Venus, whatever that means of returning to this like uh interdimensional uh I think potentials in as as souls in bodies that we live in right now. Uh, I think that's a job of artists for me. Uh, is to open those doors and uh, to turn those like transform the visible to to accessible information for us to think about what what is Venus to us, you know, and that just to me is is a symbol, right? It's it's a door for us to understand like other things that we don't see are interconnecting us together, including you know how I'm interconnected Christian even not knowing her just a few months ago, and how you know with Stephen as well, and now to you and Jose to uh, to to do this. Yeah, so I'm really excited for y'all to play and how you think of, you know, the kind of, uh, I guess, our social political lens. I've done activism, I've been really active in the whole social political activism in the last eight years. And now, like, Christian has given me a chance to, opportunity to really, I think, come from a different lens of how I would interact and talk about social activism with nature um, in the ways that uh, that is this, you know. Mm -hmm. So I want people to play and think about things and it doesn't have to be so serious either too. And how do you, how does the work impact how you interact in space with people and with technology and how do you weave the images and create images with your body that decolonize what you think is like, what dance means to you, you know. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the, the reason why I uh, risk being rejected by Sammy and knocked on his door was I really wanted to do something interactive rather than like uh, everybody just expects to be entertained and you have to do something. So I wanted the title to be Venus, Back to Venus, because Venus has the symbology of being a planet of love. It used to allegedly have water. Uh, I am a Libra, so apparently it is ruled by Venus. We are talking this, this day and age about migrating to Mars as a sign of hope. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, if you bring the same humanity to another planet, what could the result possibly be? Or is it better to think what are the best of human essence and trying to preserve and live more fully out of that essence. Um, it is important for us to register that as individuals and collectively we have agency rather than you expect a structure to present all the solutions to you. You mm -hmm. kind of really have to work it and interact mm -hmm. with it. And I also love mm -hmm. the fact that I had an 89 year old uncle here who is not old at all. People thought he's in his 70s. Mm -hmm. He came here on my opening and he turned around thinking, saying, This is so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, if you were anything between any age between six and I don't know, he's 89, like as long as you can move a little bit, even with your fingers, you can create your, your own patterning. It doesn't matter what you do, but you have to be there, right? So it's a good way to have non so called non art people being involved in thinking through art ideas, but applying stuff that's going on in the real life and, and hopefully you know, something else comes out like who knows right like if activism can, can happen on the art turf but I try. <laughs> well we should do with this piece I guess is mm -hmm. once once this is over we could clean the chairs up so, so you both can actually play with the with the piece. Eh? We we're gonna yeah. run the jam session next Saturday. <laughs> Everybody's invited and then we'll photograph them and you know send them back. Thank you.
Um, and if there is any other question, I mean, I, I, it's kind of time to move on, but uh, yeah. yeah, please go ahead. How about the peace inside? That's also the ocean. And yeah, uh, you you yeah. remember you remember. Oh, I don't know whether everybody has a, the chance to look at it, but uh, it's a roughly three minute video single channel piece. It's in the middle of the staircase. In a what I call infinity pool. So I videoed the piece. Uh, almost exactly a year ago and I run quite a bit and I also needed to seek refuge in the lockdown. Uh, refuge as in uh, solace and comfort and I found my sweet spot being around Spanish banks. So I've been there repeatedly. One day I saw this mm -hmm. amazing mist, like a halo. Uh, covering the North Shore Mountains that I personally am calling Sleeping Beauty. I don't know any, if anybody has seen the North Shore Mountains and realize what I'm talking about, like, like a beautiful, like a beauty sleeping, but with the head turned the other way. So she turned this way with a cast of mist, like I was like, I suddenly started singing the English version of the jazz tune Misty. I couldn't help it. I then focus on like taking a really good video of it, took it home, googled the song. I knew the song from as a teenager. Then I'm like, oh God, this is so central to the theme. And then I discover that the original tune uh, maker, Errol Cat Garner, had been inspired apparently by a misty scene sitting next to the window pane of a flight thinking of his beloved. And then he got someone else to write the lyrics, which later became the Johnny Mathis version. Uh, the lyrics was written by Johnny Burke. And I'm like, I also wanted to explore East Meat West. <laughs> Stephen was like, why don't you sing? He didn't even know that I sang. <laughs> <laughs> Had complete faith of like, I don't know, why do you know that I sing? But I was like, maybe I should sing. Then I'm like, okay, I have an idea. I'm gonna write the lyrics. I'm not gonna sing the original. I'm gonna write the lyrics in Cantonese, which I had never done. <laughs> so like I worked through it and then, and then we, we decided that, you know, I wanted to, to have a split screen so that it looks like the, is one laser bolt disappearing, reappearing. It's a bit like falling off the edges of the earth kind of thing, but reappearing is, a lot of relationship. A, a connection. Well. Like yeah, another yeah, way yeah. of thinking yeah. about connection. It's just like interactive new medium. Why yeah. that? Because yeah. I'm trying to test yet another medium to talk about the same theme. Connection. Because if you're talking about love for the environment, it's your connection with the environment. So however many iterations and permutations, I'm still talking about the same thing. Because in, in Greek, for example, there's six, seven different types of definitions of love and you know there you go like it's endless yes thank you thank you guys i wanted to um really really thank steven dragon for the show and always uh, bring the best out of the works and making it very coherent. Well, same on my friend who is an interdisciplinary person as well and so we connect um, in terms of interpretation of the world, endless discussions. Sammy Chien who would even bother collaborating with me. <laughs> <laughs> and all of you who made the effort to come here today, especially Jerry, my friend, who actually brought her leg a while ago, first day out of the class. Mm -hmm. Valerie for taking her here. Mm -hmm. And all of you, thanks so much. So
山聚，无奈南灰色记忆，却又叹息谁？是其实愿时日都退。谁？难道回想怎不知？冷落那心情，雨过天晴，却又有点醉。在跟你自醉。